public health work, specifically looking to acknowledge the weight that these trying times have had on mental health and discuss ways to nurture a culture of hope as we continue to fight for health equity. So we are, it is our great honor to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Joya Mukherjee. And I'll speak briefly about her background, but then jump right in. Um, so Dr. Mukherjee is the Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, a position she has held since 2000. She is an internist, pediatrician, infectious disease specialist, human rights advocate, and associate professor of Harvard Medical School. She is also a fierce supporter of Engage, and so we greatly admire her here at this network. Um, she is a teacher and a scholar and the author of the widely used textbook, An Introduction to Global Health Delivery, Practice, Equity, Human Rights, which is published by Oxford University Press and is now in its second edition. A lifelong advocate and specialist in the field of global health and health as a human, Dr. Mukherjee serves on the board of directors and advises several international organizations and agencies in their efforts to deliver healthcare with human rights approach to poor communities across the globe. So welcome Dr. Mukherjee and thank you so much for joining us. If it's all right, we'll just jump right in with questions and hopefully offer the space open to the group later on. Yeah, that's great. So um, hi everybody, I'll start and just say a few words. I'm happy to take questions. Um, I am in the car, as you can see, I'm actually heading to do fundraiser, fundraisers in Martha's Vineyard. Um, Nick said, oh, you don't have to join. But I said, no, 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 it's engaged. I'm in. So I just returned from Malawi last night at, or last afternoon. At, and Neil Laird. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, just. You know, I know we're going to have some questions, but having just returned from Malawi and Lesotho, um, I'm so energized. I'm so energized about all the work you all do at Engage. I'm so energized at the work we do together. And I'm in like the most amazing position, I think, to talk about burnout because the thing about staying for a long time, you know, part of what we say at PIH is we stay is you see that the world can change. And not only do you see it, you build a team where you're doing it together. And you know, uh, the first time I ever was in Nano, Malawi um, was 2007. There was not a hospital. There was not a doctor for miles and miles. Um, there were very few nurses. There was no way to get surgery, a C-section. If you had a broken leg, you know, the road was washed out. And today, you know, there are two hospitals, there are 12 health centers, there's a giant, um, and people have been there together for so long. And um, I'm going to see if I can share a picture uh, with you. Um, let's see, here we go. Yeah, photos. I'm going to share this picture. Um, it's so Zoom needs access to my photos. There we go. Yes. I can't see you, but can you hear me? We can hear you. The connection cut okay. off for a second. Yeah, I, I think when I was trying to, to get my photos, the connection cut off. So I, I'm going to just show you a couple of photos from my trip and um, talk a little bit about what they mean and why it's so important to me to talk. Joy, if it's easier, I'm happy to, if you want to WhatsApp them to me, I can share my screen. Whatever is so easier. This is a picture of me doing a visit. Um, Your connection is cutting out a little bit. Do you want to make uh, Okay. We see the pictures. Let me see if I. The video. Okay. Okay. Let me um, let me actually take off this. Sometimes it's the Bluetooth. Let's just do that. Is that better? Yes, that's is that great. better, guys. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, so this is a, a picture of me doing a home visit in Dombe, Malawi. Um, 
And it's a woman who has had bad seizure disorders. Because of that, she never was able to go to school. She doesn't know how to read or write. Um, as soon as I saw her, I knew she was one of our chronic care patients with seizures because she has very severe burns on her arms. And often that's how we see our seizure patients because they fall into cooking fires. Um, the man, the tall man with the blue uh, iPad in his hand is a man named Sam. I met him in 2007. Um, and he is a person living with HIV. He was almost dead. He weighed about 40 um, kilos. I could have picked him up in my arms. Um, he has been treated now since 2007. He runs our program on social and economic rights. He visits each and every extremely vulnerable person and does an inventory of what they need, what their assets are, how much family responsibility, what their food security is. Um, and he documents that and then we work to provide those things. He is a pillar of Partners in Health. He's a very kind man. He now has two children who are HIV negative. His wife has remained HIV negative throughout. And he's a friend. You know, I can talk to him about things we did in 2007, about things we did in 2012, about what's happening today, and look at him helping his community. Behind me in the white shirt and the vest is Chembe Kezo Kachimanga. He is our chief medical officer. Um, I've worked with him since 2012. He grew up in a slum in Blantyre, walked by a big complex of buildings for his whole childhood and didn't know what it was. And it turned out it was the College of Medicine in Malawi, uh, where he is now a graduate. His family never would have been able to afford for him to go to school. But during the AIDS movement, one of the many things that PIH fought for is long-term training. And because of that, the government of Malawi put 25 additional scholarships for the College of Medicine. And he was one of the people to get that. He's worked in Malawi and then also was uh, working with PIH in Sierra Leone for two years and helping set up our primary care there. So these are two men who I have worked with for decades now, decade for Chembe, two decades or almost two decades with Sam. Um, they're friends and they're, they're colleagues. And we've, we've really seen major change um, in Malawi because of our friendship and because of our collective work. Um, and, you know, being with them and seeing them rise to these positions of responsibility and to be able to help other people in the community is really what gives me like so much hope and fun. Um, and so, you know, for me, the biggest preventive burnout is the long term commitment to not only patients, but to a team of people who are all fighting the good fight um, and can have joy and, and fellowship as we do it. So I just wanted to share that with you because I just got back um, and it was just such a joyful experience, both in Malawi and in Lesotho. Um, but particularly because of the long-term change you can see. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing those stories. And as someone who spent a bit of my early childhood in Malawi, that absolutely warms my heart to see how much progress has happened over the last yeah. few years. Um, and I think in your, in your discussion of the friendships that you've made over the course of your work in Malawi and Lesotho and in all of the DIH's partner countries, you, you show how that friendship is something that sustains you. But I'm, I'm sure the work that you've done has not always been easy and frustration and disappointment um, and uh, burnout, as you mentioned, is something you probably experienced a lot during this work. So how do you confront those emotions as well as your desire to maintain hope in this work? Well, uh, for those of you who want to be doctors or nurses um, or any kind of clinician, social workers, psychologists, I do think um, if you if you lean into the care of other people, it is a good antidote to despair because you do see people get better. And so even when the arc of um, the world seems really stacked against you, you can see one person get better. And that's why I wanted to start with the story of Sam, uh, because the meaningful life that he has that uh, with his family, with his community, 
uh, it really gives you hope that despite how hard it is, like people actually get better. And this is why the long-term commitment makes a difference too, because if you just go in and out, dip your toe in the water, you don't see that change happens over a generation or half a generation, right? I've been doing this for like technically now a generation. And so you see people, you know, doing better, their kids doing better, becoming grandparents um, and, uh, you know, graduating from university. So I think um, being a clinician of some kind or being proximate to people who are the, um, you know, really on the front lines of suffering and seeing that things get better is a source for me of optimism. I mean, the other thing, and I talk about this a lot with my own family, with my partner, is just being able to laugh. Um, it is, you know, if you can't have laughter and humor, you can't stay in the work because everybody wants, I mean, you know, happiness is what we're fighting for at the end of the day. You know, I laugh with my patients, I sing with my patients, they don't want us to be just dour and, and sad. They want joy also. And so, you know, making jokes, um, you know, enjoying the, the, the company of, of humans. If you like people, um, you know, that is also a huge antidote. Um, I was just on the, you know, wards, um, uh, on the <laughs> wards in Lesotho, and, you know, there was a very funny guy and like it, patient and we were laughing and making jokes and, you know, he has a very serious disease. Um, but, you know, he appreciates joy and humor. And so I think trying to find ways uh, to laugh and to enjoy the company of other people is like a very, very important thing to me as well. Thank you so much for that. So, so incredibly meaningful. Um, for our next question, I know we all admire you mainly because of, for one one reason, being your ability to balance so many different aspects of healthcare delivery and teaching and activism. And I think we resonate with that because many of us as students and working people are also trying to manage various aspects of our workload on top of volunteer organizing with Engage. Yeah. But even with that sort of resonance, it seems incomprehensible how you manage to do what you do. So how do you manage all the complex pieces of your puzzle and still find balance? Um, you know, I, I would say it's easier in my position than it is in yours, because what I what I think you should aspire to do um, that allows you to, I don't think I've balanced anyway. I just fell down and broke my ankle and I'm super clumsy. So I think it's like a, it's a, um, it's an allegory for my lack of balance, but, um, but I, you know, I think the goal of your life maybe should be to um, integrate the things you love together, you know, integrate your friendships with your work, integrate your, you know, hobbies as much as you can, and then you don't feel so fractionated, you know, um, I think it's, it's much harder when you're a student because you have a task which is learning stuff. Um, and, you know, I think the volunteer part can be fractionated from that, but hopefully some of you, you know, you've made friendships through school that then carry into engage. Um, but I think for me at this moment, like teaching is part of my PIH duty really. And like, I was so privileged to, be in Lesotho with two of my former graduate students from the, um, uh, from from Harvard, the master's program in global health delivery. One of whom now is the executive director of Lesotho, Molino uh, in De Zigie, and the other is the chief medical officer there, Afam Adan. So you know, teaching them is a joy because they're going to also continue the work, and then we can share that experience. And then similarly. Um, I saw three of my former students in, in Malawi, um, Dimitri Suffren, who's a Haitian, who runs the HIV TB program in Malawi, uh, Kapira um, Sitilari, who, who runs our master's program, um, and uh, who is the third? Um, there is a third. Oh, Noel Kalanga, who is now at the College of Medicine. So, so I, think, um, I think part of what makes me able to juggle, if you will, is that it's not fully juggling because it's like all the, the same mission of trying to uh, 
raise the standard of he healthcare and build really build a team to do that. So I I feel like that's you know they're they're similar. Wonderful, thank you. And I think I'll ask one more question and then uh, maybe get some questions from the group, but. Starting tomorrow, all of us here will be advocating for our with our own representatives for the Paul Farmer Memorial Resolution. Um, as you know, this resolution is reflecting Paul's vision for the drastic upscaling of equity focused investments in the five S's and accountability for historic and ongoing injustices. You nailed that, Sadia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could describe what this resolution means to you and any advice you have for us on how to stay engaged the long haul knowing that these long-term injustices require long-term campaign. So, you know, obviously we all loved Paul. Uh, many of you met him or at least saw him on Zoom. Um, he was such a visionary. I still find it hard to talk about him in the past tense. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's still devastating. But what Paul gave us, I've said many times, is a kind of a vision, a roadmap, but it's, it's very, to me, quite specific. It's quite specific in that you start with a person. You know, there was a recent um, article that Global Health starts with partnerships. And I was like kind of chatting with the authors on Twitter as we do in this era. And I said, really, Global Health doesn't start with partnerships. It starts with a person, right? It starts with seeing that person in front of you um, in whatever fashion you are. I mean, I've seen our drivers do this. I've seen our finance people do it. Who is the vulnerable person that we are taking care of at that moment? And how do we work to make sure that person lives, has dignity, has justice? Um, and I think Paul's vision is what changed global health in that way. When I was a young person, you know, your age or a little older and heading to do public health interventions in Africa, you really looked at people in a way as numbers. You know, there was this idea that if you vaccinate everybody, you know, then you can prevent, um, you know, child, you know, preventable diseases like measles. Um, but meanwhile, if the one individual child had a broken leg or if the mother had pneumonia, there was no treatment for them. And Paul changed that. Paul said, that's just not okay. That is not a human way to look at that. So a lot of things in the Paul Farmer resolution are really about how do we provide care to people and how do we build health as a human right, which is not about you know, spreading money around like peanut butter on bread, but really focusing on uh, moving money toward the burden of disease, um, helping governments to treat people and assuming that if we really want equity, we've got to put money into that fifth S, particularly around social support, around school and food security, job creation. And so for me, if I had had to make a decision, the first time I worked in Africa and Kenya, where I was just doing like vaccine campaigns, weighing babies, but no real care, I would not have wanted to do that work because it seemed jarringly unequal to not fight like hell for each individual patient. And so I think what we saw with the AIDS epidemic, um, and that's why I wanted to put it in the front of this Paul Farmer resolution is, if you get the money and you use it in a way to build systems, it changes everything. And that's what Paul showed us. And that's what we want to continue. Instead of these very vertical interventions that you know barely scratch the surface, real long-term commitments to health equity through through the five S's. So um, that's what it means to me. Thank you so much for that reflection. I'm wondering, do you have time to take one or two questions? Yes, from definitely. Okay. Yep. So everyone, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to pose a question, and please introduce yourselves as well. I see Shri, go ahead. Hi, um, Dr. Mukherjee, thank you so much for uh, coming to talk Everyone to us today. Everyone calls me Joya, yeah. <laughs> oh, Joya, all right. <laughs> um, so thank you for your advice on integrating things that you love together to yeah. address burnout. But I was wondering on the flip side, um, when you meld these aspects together, how do you prevent yourself 
um, from when you have a failure or setback in one aspect from it seeping, seeping into everything else? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, Tree. I, I mean, I have to probably admit that I was born with like a bit of an optimistic, not a bit, a lot of an optimistic temperament. So uh, I've never had to cultivate it in the way that some of you might. So, um, so just to say that, like, I'm very fortunate in that. I think I, you know, came out like as partially a cheerleader. Um, but I would say the important thing is to have the long view as much as possible. The setbacks um, at the end of the day are not really about you individually, right? Um, and that there are people that are working harder, closer to the problem. There are people who are actually suffering um, from illness and poverty that need you to be optimistic. And so, you know, one of the things I always think about is, you know, think of the dire poverty that a mother has who's, you know, trying to raise four children on her own. And think of the optimism it takes for her to get out of bed or get off her mat in the morning, go sell her candies in the market to try to pay for porridge for her kids um, and you know, pay whatever little money for school fees that she can. It is in a way a privilege for us to get too discouraged because she can't, she can't get discouraged. I mean, she can be discouraged and we see depression, anxiety. It's not like, you know, I'm not going to say poor people are happy kind of thing, but there is a kind of optimism and moving forward that people need to have despite their difficulties. And so I think trying to internalize that setbacks are what people feel every day and our setbacks are going to be far less um, and so we have some, if we make this commitment to this work, we've got some responsibility to kind of understand that, as Paul used to say, we're siding with the losers. Um, and it's, it's really about their struggle, not, not only ours. I mean, I'm not saying don't take care of yourself, please do. And then the other thing I would say is everybody who's going to do this work should see a shrink. And I, I've told a million people this, um, but it is such hard work that you need to really have a plan for your mental health. Um, I've been seeing a psychiatrist for probably 30, 25 years and I don't know how I would deal with some of the setbacks totally alone. So open that up and make sure that, um, that, you, that you take care of your mental health because um, it's, it's not easy. And then the third thing I would say is take vacations. Like don't feel like, oh, you know, a, some poor person couldn't take vacations. All true, but, you know, try to, to disconnect and, and have joy because at the end of the day, as I said earlier, joy is what we're fighting for, right? We're fighting for everybody to have joy, have time with their families and their friends, have, have happiness. So don't deprive yourself of those things. Thank you so much. <laughs> Maybe one last question before we have to say goodbye to Joya. Any, anyone have one more question? Money. I guess I could. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Um, hi, Joya. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I just have a question about your songwriting. Like, what ah! does it mean um, to create music and to relish music as sort of your revolutionary act on top of everything that you do? And how can I, as a poet or anyone here with like musical talent or love of arts, um, integrate that passion into the work that we do? Oh, thank you for that question. I'm a new songwriter. I never wrote a song till I was probably 56. So, um, or 54 or something, I'm 58 now. So it's, that's a new thing, but definitely music, playing music, singing, um, singing with other people and listening to music um, has always been a way to sort of center myself of what we're fighting for, right? Because, because music is an expression of our humanity. Right, music is an expression of joy, of sorrow. Um, so I would say, one to keep 
doing it because it, it helps you to be a whole person. I would say too, if you can, sharing it with other people because it is a way to, you know, see commonality. You know, people in many cultures around the world will sing all the time. They will recite, they will grab the mic. You know, it's it's the US that's sort of more sterile, particularly like white patriarchal American, you know, people don't dance, they don't sing, they don't, you know, I mean, like, what is that? That is really kind of just bizarre compared to the rest of the world. So understand with this, with art, uh, but also with this work of social justice, that even if your circles that you walk in, which unfortunately often are white patriarchal circles in the US, um, even if those circles that you walk in don't appreciate what you're about, the billions of people in the world that are on your side, right? Because you can be in a fishing village in Ghana and hear the most beautiful singing as people bring in their nets. You know, you can be in a church in, in Haiti and hear a beautiful sort of oratory. And so um, definitely I work at that. I work at when I when I speak that is that I you know I read orators I I try because I think these are ways that the majority of the world communicates right not in the bizarre academic language that we learn but through song through poetry through oratory um, and and really I would say just stay with that and know that oh you know I mean I have you know, at least a hundred different poems in my head at all times that I that I rely on pieces of them to, to keep me sort of sane and grounded. So so stay with it and try as much as you can to share because um, listening, sharing, that's just like a huge part of how we like, you know, going back to the very first question about burnout, that's how we, you know, stay as whole people. Uh, so I'm waiting for some poetry when you're ready, send it to me. I'd love to read it. Who's your favorite poet? Thank you so much. Oh, um, my favorite poet is actually um, my sister, my late sister who passed away. And so oh, she uh, so wasn't great. a renowned scholar, but she is um, the favorite poet who will always be with me. So thank you so oh, much. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Mine is Nikki Giovanni. So if you don't know Nikki's poetry, uh, take a look. Uh, and, but I have many, so so yeah, let's share some poetry. Paul and I used to send poetry back and forth all the time, um, just just about you know poetry that related to um, the the feelings we had at the moment. And I don't know if you all know Sri Shramashunder, who's one of the founders of Beale. He is a poet. Um, that's actually how I met him. He sent me some poetry he had written. Um, and one of his closest friends was the the late poet June Jordan. So yeah, there there are a lot of poetry people around town, around the global health community. Thank you so much. Wonderful. That's such a great way to end talking about the beauty of art and and how it connects us all as peoples. But thank you so much, Joya, for spending a bit of time with us today. Uh, your comments on joy and partnership and friendship and being in it for the long haul are things that I think will resonate with us long after this day and into the campaign year. So we thank you so much. Wish you safe travels as you head uh, to the vineyard, but thank you so much and we hope to see you soon. All right, bye everybody. Thanks for including me. Bye.